Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Q&As. So let's go ahead and knock this out. I'm going to have 10 normal fitness related questions, and then people ask me a couple of good personal questions. I saw about five good personal questions. I just grabbed two of those to throw in at the end. So if you don't care about my personal views, political views, economic views, philosophical views, things like that, you can just skip the last two questions, guys, and all the fitness related stuff will be in the first 20 to 25 minutes or so. So let's get this started. First question. Why is it that the stronger you are, the harder and more exhausting it is to do high reps with the same percentage of one rep max, particularly on the demanding lifts such as squats and deadlifting? Uh, for example, when my one rep max on the squat used to be 140 kilos, it was a lot easier to do 8 to 10 reps with 70 to 75 percent of one rep max. Whereas in now when my one rep max is 190 kilos, doing the same amount of reps uh, with the same percentage is torture. number of things going on here. First of all, as you get stronger, it is more taxing on your body because you are doing more total weight and workload. Recovery becomes more difficult. It shouldn't affect so much your lifting itself, but your recovery is an issue. Now, what I want to say here is that a lot of lifters, this is a cardio issue. It's because you're lifting a heavier weight with high reps, your cardiovascular capacity isn't up to par. And that's a real big issue. Now, I know a lot of guys will say, well, Jason, you, you're cardiovascular out of shape because we hear you're heavy breathing. Now, I have a deviated septum, guys, and I don't want to take the month off from making videos or spend the $5,000 on the surgery to fix it right now. I probably will eventually, but once I do, you guys won't see me on YouTube for a while. So it's a deviated septum. I actually do cardio every single day. And I don't do it to get shredded. I don't do it for aesthetics. I do it for health, cardiovascular capacity, my overall health and athleticism. That matters here when you guys start going to these higher reps on things. You guys have seen me do, you know, 12 rep sets with heavy deadlifts before. And it's because I do a lot of cardio. And it's important when you get to stronger, the weight starts getting heavier, you start running out of breath, you run out of steam. So if you're not cardiovascularly in shape, high rep sets on things like squats and deadlifts, anything over about seven or eight reps is going to bury you once you get decently strong and you're actually having to do some real workload with high reps, it can actually be uh, your cardiovascular system that is failing out because you're having to do a lot more work to, uh, to lift 400 pounds for 12 reps than it is to lift 200 pounds for 12 reps. Your cardiovascular system and the oxygen to your blood and uh, to your muscle tissue can actually be a limiting factor here, not just muscle strength. So something to factor in, if this is really the struggle that you're experiencing and not just a recovery issue, then you need to be doing more cardio. You're just simply out of shape. All right, next question. Would running something like Bulgarian Light only really be for the very advanced training as returning to a normal frequency approach of squatting two to three times a week would no longer be sufficient enough in stimulating adaptation? Much like if you started cutting and immediately slashed your calories down to 1,800, you wouldn't have any room to maneuver once you plateaued starting at the end, so to speak. No, that's not true. And I know a lot of people try to say that. They're like, no, if you do some extreme training style, nothing else will ever work for you again. Things will definitely work again. As long as you have progressive overload or progressive workload, you will make adaptations. You don't even always have to have it at the same rate you have before. You could go back to squatting twice a week and still get stronger on your squat, even if you ran a Bulgarian light and squatted every day for a year straight. It's totally doable. You might not make as fast of progress as you will at the higher frequency because really high frequency training until large amounts of drugs come into the mix to offset this generally produce faster strength gains. We know that. That's just how things work. However, it doesn't mean that you can't make progress at a lower frequency just because you train that way. Again, that's a total myth. Just like the other thing that you said is a total myth also. If you started 1,800 calories... You won't quit losing fat more quickly. Your metabolism doesn't change that way. That's, that's nonsense from the metabolic damage crowd, which is complete bullshit. The science doesn't even support any of that. You'll lose fat faster, but you will also lose muscle mass faster. That's why you don't cut hard and fast like that and drop to 1,800 calories when your maintenance is 3,000. You'll lose weight more quickly. You'll lose fat more quickly, but you'll lose muscle and strength as well. Now, and the extra muscle loss in the long term might slow your BMI and your um, even your active metabolic rate more because of the muscle loss. But that's because you lost muscle, not because the 1800 itself made you stall. You will never drop to a point as a healthy adult active male to where you won't lose weight on 1800 calories. 
unless you get down to anorexic levels and you're down to 100 pounds as a male or something, you're never going to stop losing body fat or weight at 1,800 calories if you're physically active, lifting and doing cardio. It is simply not going to happen. I don't care how much your metabolism slows. It goes back to my stuff about metabolic derangement. That just doesn't happen. So let's just dispel two myths with one question. That is not the real world. That is a metabolic delusion, which I've got quite a few videos covering. You, you won't stop losing on that as an active male. All right, next question. Jason, I've heard about uh, laxogenin, supposedly a plant steroid. I'm not looking to buy it, but information is low in this. Could this really be a natural supplement or just another con? Every single previous thing along these lines throughout recorded supplement history has been a con. Every test booster that has ever been released, synthetic or otherwise, has turned out to be a con. Why would you expect this one that has no data and research on it yet to be any different? Why would you expect any different? It's kind of like that old expression that goes, um, trick me once, shame on you, trick me twice, shame on me. If after the 50th one of these things, you guys are still falling for any of this stuff, I don't know what to tell you. If you honestly think it's even worth taking seriously until there's been tons of independent research, at least 10 independent universities with no funding from these companies have researched this and produced results on their own, independent of any supplement company funding it, I wouldn't even consider taking it seriously. I would even waste my time looking at it. All of this stuff has turned out historically to be scams that work purely off placebo. Every single test booster throughout recorded history, including the synthetic ones that they're making like DMMA or DAA, I'm sorry, D-aspartic acid. They've all turned out to be hoaxes. And they only work through placebo because you think they're gonna work. So this one's gonna be no different. I can almost, you can almost take that to the bank, 99.9% .9 sure. And if I'm wrong, then hey, I'm wrong. One time they finally produce something that work. And if they do, it will be banned and the FDA will slap a prescription or a, a restriction on it as soon as it's proven to work. In which case you won't have to worry about it then either. Because there's other better things <laughs> that require prescriptions that are uh, substances that are controlled. So there'll be no need to worry about it at that point. Either way, no point in worrying about it. All right, next question. Jason, you talk a lot about the physical side of training, but what about the psychology of training and what is the best mindset to have when lifting or playing sports at a serious level and generally every challenge in life thinks? Well, the problem is that 99.9% .9 of my fans will never be competing in a sport at a serious level. Uh, I've known a lot of champions. I've known professional athletes. I have professional athletes in my family. I know self-made millionaires. I know very successful businessmen. My father's a self-made millionaire. He's a multi-millionaire. I'll cover that later in the video on something else. Anyone who actually claims to have background checked me would know my father's a self-made millionaire, ex-green beret, all that stuff. It's all publicly available information. Now, that being said, in my experience, people who are very successful at what they do in the mindset of a champion, they will do anything to win. Literally anything, no limits. Their morality doesn't even come into the equation. Ethics don't even come into the equation. Now, they might have personal ethics and guidelines that they tend to follow, but when push comes to shove and they are back in a corner and it comes to between winning and losing, they will cheat. They will do whatever it takes to win. That is the mentality of a winner. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, is whatever it is that you're pursuing, that you decide in your head, hey, I'm going to pursue this one day, what you need to stop and ask is, is that goal more important to you than your personal ethics and integrity? Is it more important than the basic morals that you possess? And if the answer is no, then I'm going to recommend that you keep that thing as a non-serious pursuit, not something that you're determined to be the best at. Because if you start taking the other approach, you're going to limit yourself. And the worst case scenario, I mean, like we see that at the Olympic level, like with the whole Nancy Kerrigan thing, um, when Tanya Harding had people break her legs so that she could try to win a gold medal. That's how extreme a champion is, and that's repugnant to most of us, but you have to understand that people who are going to compete in an extreme level in anything really think like that, and sometimes they even take it too far to the point to where they commit actions that most of us would think of as morally repugnant. And so that's the, the question you have to ask yourself is how bad do you really want something? Are you willing to sacrifice everything for it? If not, you might want to be willing to accept fifth place. You might want to be willing to accept that you won't make the millions doing this you think you we might not win that gold medal you might have to settle for a bronze and that's okay because it's a good thing to have morals it's a good thing to have ethics it's a good thing to have limits but that sort of thinking 
will not allow you to have the greatest levels of success in any endeavors. And uh, that's a good thing, because we need the majority of people to have some sort of ethics and, and morality and limits in place. We need that as a society. So that's fine that there can only be so many of the best in any given endeavor. It sure makes life easier for the rest of us and makes for a smoother flowing society. Just points to consider. All right, next question. Do you need to implement progressive overload with isolation exercises as with compounds in order to receive the benefits of muscle growth? For example, if I curl 45 pound dumbbells for 10 reps one week, do I need to curl 50 pound dumbbells the next in order to grow my bicep? Uh, no, generally the same workload will continue to make adaptations for about three weeks straight before the law of accommodation kicks in. So actually your biceps will grow for pretty much three weeks straight off of the exact same workload. Now, the thing that you need to consider when you're talking about isolation movements, they're not the only thing you're doing. If you're doing weighted chin-ups in addition to the, the dumbbell curls, you're going to be more fatigued by the time you get to your dumbbell curls if you have increased the workload on your chin-ups. So let's say you've been doing weighted chin-ups with a 45-pound plate for six rep sets. You go up to seven reps. You've already stimulated your biceps to more work and then you come behind them and you're doing the same metabolic work with the dumbbells afterwards that you did before, you're also gonna see bicep growth off of that. It isn't essential for adaptation and growth for you to increase every exercise you're doing for a muscle. If one exercise increases, the cumulative effect and the cumulative fatigue and adaptation placed upon that muscle starts adding up. So as long as one of the exercises, one of them increases, every three weeks, you will continue to grow. It might not be that most ideal growth. It might be slow growth. It might be the snail's pace, which is always going to be as you get more advanced anyways, but you are still moving forward. So no, not every exercise, particularly isolation stuff, has to increase. As long as the big compounds are increasing, it's okay for the isolation stuff to stay stagnant for a couple months and you'll continue to grow because you're doing it after the bigger stuff that has already fatigued you more and you're just finishing the muscles off with additional fatigue. You'll continue to grow as long as something increases every three weeks. Any of your, your list for that body part. It doesn't have to be just the isolation work. So a point to consider, remember, adaptation and growth in the muscles about the cumulative fatigue of everything that you do in the gym, not just that one exercise. It's all about the cumulative workload and fatigue over time. That's what your body adapts to. Chronic stress, not acute. All right, next question. Uh, how would you recommend programming the squat and deadlift around each other for an intermediate training full body for powerlifting three times a week? I often find my deadlift suffers if I train it after heavy squats for extended periods of time, and I'm often fatigued after sets of squats and bench. Well, let me ask you a simple question. Are you doing deadlift-only competitions? As a powerlifter, I assume you're doing the full powerlifting meet, which means squat, bench, and deadlift. Are you ever going to be in a situation in competition to where you don't squat before you deadlift? The answer is no, then why do you need to train that way? The reason you see so many guys who they get to a comp and they can deadlift a lot in training, they'll squat more in competition than they hit in the gym. You see that pretty frequently, but then when they get to the deadlift, they deadlift less than they deadlift in the gym. And the reason for that, because they're deadlifting fresh and they compete fatigue. They compete after they've already had to hit max squats and max bench presses. And particularly the squat, it fatigues those muscles before you get to the deadlifting competition. So we can argue about this all day long as to which one is better. You see world champions who've done it both ways. They separate them, more people who only deadlift after they squat. So at the end of the day, it's probably not that big of a deal that you're fatigued when you get to the deadlift because you're going to be fatigued when you get to the deadlift in a competition also. And the only real difference is you're gonna build strength on both. If you're fatigued from the squat when you get to the deadlift, you're still gonna get stronger on the deadlift if you have progressive overload. And the same is if you separate them, you're still going to get progressive overload, you're still going to adapt, get stronger, get bigger. But the only difference is if you deadlift after you squat, it may give you a more realistic expectation of what your competition numbers are gonna be like. It'll give you a better baseline for your strength because you're always pulling somewhat fatigue, just like you have to do in comp. It will give you a better baseline for knowing what to expect when you go into competition. Outside of that, there's probably no real difference because at the end of the day, you're going to pull what you're going to pull based on your training. Uh, just another way to look at it. All right, next question. Hey, Jason, what could someone do about elbow pain when high bar squatting? Sorry, just checking my battery. For me, uh, when the loads get heavy, I tend to grip the bar extremely hard in order to maximize lat recruitment to help stabilize, and I think that is where the pain is coming from. All right, I'm not going through the rest. You guys can read that question yourself. All right, there's your problem. That's why your elbows are hurting. You're gripping the bar too hard 
on the squat. Now we could talk a lot about radiant effect and gripping weights to get stronger, but when you're doing primarily a lower body exercise that uses upper body for stability, you're not getting that same additional strength by gripping it because it's not a deadlift. Gripping the bar as hard as you can on a deadlift has benefits. On a squat, gripping the bar too hard just puts stress on things like your elbows or your shoulders with no real benefit to your actual strength of the lift. So you need to not worry about the lat recruitment there. If you want your lats to stabilize better on the squat, pull your shoulder blades in tighter. You don't have to actually even grip the bar on the squat as long as you get fingers over it. You're just, the arms are there on the squat to stabilize the weight. You don't have to grip the bar hard to do that. That is what is hurting your elbows. I'm going to recommend you stop doing that. If you want better uh, lat engagement for stability, you need to learn to retract your scapula harder. That doesn't require you to grip the bar hard to do. You need to just practice scapular retraction. So there's an easy fix to your problem. All right, next question. In non-firearms related news, what, there's non-firearms related news? I got no time for that shit. All right, that will piss off all my European subscribers. I'm not sure if you have covered this before. Uh, if you have, the link would be super. What are your thoughts on squat shoes? I have acceptable form and it has been uh, critiqued by reputable trainers, but I can't seem to shake some knee pain when I do volume or heavy singles. I currently wear beaver and toe shoes uh, to squat and could hit a one rep max of 425 to depth. I'm also old and fat. Could it just be factors like that that contribute to knee pain or could squat shoes help? Uh, the squat shoes might actually help. Give them a try. It's worth trying. I find I can go about an inch deeper in squat shoes than I can in V-rooms. I have squatted in both on videos. I find the squat shoes help a little bit. Someone else had mentioned down below you they saw one of your videos you were wearing knee sleeves. Lose the knee sleeves if you're getting knee pain. That may be contributing. We don't have evidence of that, but we know knee wraps can damage knees over time. There is a possibility that knee sleeves could be doing it. And the only other thing I would recommend on top of that is going to be deload is needed for knee pain and make sure that you're keeping your hamstring strong. You can say what you're deadlifting or what you're doing for hamstrings and that could be a factor for knee joint stability. So those are the things that you need to consider and look at. All right, next question. Is there any negative effects from taking many anti-inflammatory supplements? I mean, all natural ingredients like turmeric, tart, cherry, ginger, omega-3s, all in conjunction. Honestly, guys, I think most of this stuff is, is just hyped up and not proven to work. In fact, you got to be careful when you're buying herbal supplements. A big chunk of them don't even have what's on the label in them. I don't see negatives other than you might just be throwing away a lot of money. The only one of these that might help with uh, inflammation is going to be the omega-3 fats. Uh, due to the effect that it can have on ratios of inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory prostaglandins in the body. But all this other stuff, I think, is honestly overhyped, overrated. I wouldn't even be wasting my money on it. The only negative is you could be throwing money away. You're not likely to see any negative effects from this. But remember, excessive fish oil does have negative effects. I've covered a lot of this in the past. There's good data on it showing that taking more than about 10 total grams of fish oil per day, about 10 grams or more, uh, chronically can actually lower your immune system function. It can harm your immune system. But uh, fish oil is the only one that's really going to probably make any difference at all with inflammation. So I think you're just kind of wasting your time and money with the others, but just my opinion and that's what you asked for. All right, next question. Dear Jason, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting nowadays? Other than the weight loss and the diet adherence benefits, there seems to be a whole host of uh, different boons ranging from boosting growth hormone to gut health. Any thoughts? I think most of it until it's further proven is probably nonsense and overhype. Boosting short burst of uh, growth hormone production and transient fluctuations in growth hormone fl fluctuation based upon lifestyle factors has never been proven in a single study to build a single ounce of muscle or burn a single ounce of fat. You're talking about transient fluctuations. They don't matter. And you'd be surprised how very little even injecting growth hormone, expensive amounts, does for people who aren't stacking it with anabolics to get a synergy. People in the normal testosterone range actually seem to get almost no benefits unless they're deficient in growth hormone from even injecting small amounts. And the transient fluctuations you get from things like this aren't even equal to that. They're, they're well below it. So I think a lot of that's been overhyped. I think the real benefits to intermittent fasting are appetite suppression. And for a lot of people, it lasts a long time, years. For a lot of people, it doesn't. For me, I noticed it reduced my appetite for about a year. I did intermittent fasting for a while and eventually it stopped working for suppressing my appetite. I just started getting really, really hungry about four hours before my feed window, uh, no matter what I did. But it did work for me for controlling appetite for a while. It was something I, I used to lose my first 80 pounds. It was one of the methods, the tools I used after I got out of bed. I gained 100 pounds um, of fat while being sick in bed for a year. 
and it was useful for probably my first 80 pounds of fat loss coming back out of bed. So I'm not saying it doesn't work, but it works until it stopped working. And a lot of people complain about this, about a third of people I've talked to, it seems to work indefinitely, about two thirds, six months, a year, two years, it stops working and the appetite just returns to where it was and then they're hungry for hours and hours a day. So it's really an appetite and diet adherence tool, nothing more. It could have some negative effects on muscle growth in addition to the appetite suppressing effects. So it's more of a fat loss tool than anything else. A lot of the other stuff, I'm sorry, the data isn't conclusive enough to say that there's a benefit here. Until there's more data, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in it. All right, that's the end of the fitness related questions. Now we're gonna get to some more personal questions. So let's knock those out. I always ask stupid questions hoping for a response. I guess you want questions that can be answered with more of an intelligent response. Jason, if you can afford to buy your own tank, would you? I know Arnold Schwarzenegger owns one, although I'm not really sure on how many rounds, if any, can be purchased. All right, the thing that you'll learn around the world in the U.S., this is very true. It's true to a more or lesser extent in other countries, depending on where you go. In the United States, getting weaponry is a matter of money. Anyone with enough money can own anything they want other than a nuclear weapon. Uh, John Wayne owned a battleship. There are rich citizens who own tanks, who own uh, fighter jets, things like that. It's a matter of you can afford the money and you can afford the bribe the government enough to let you have the licensing for it. It's purely a matter of money. Same thing with uh, machine guns in the United States. You can own those if you have enough money, like an M4 lower receiver for your AR-15 to make it burst fire instead of semi-auto runs about $15,000. Plus, you have to go through the ATF's licensing for it, which also turns it into a class three weapon, in which case if you give it to anyone else or you sell it or it's stolen and you don't tell somebody, you get 10 years in prison for it, in federal prison. So we're going into federal felony level stuff when you own these things of letting other people take them. The other downside is that as soon as you own weapons like this, the ATF can now search your property without a warrant at any time. So you lose some of your rights. But money is just a barrier to these things. It's all a matter of money. Now, that being said, I probably will, with all my long-term endeavors, end up doing pretty well financially. I'll also probably inherit a decent amount of money one day. We'll, we'll see how all that goes. There's no guarantee of that. But would I own a tank? Probably not, because I don't see the practical use of it. My viewpoint on any sort of weapon or things like that, I don't care how cool they are. I want to see practicality, and I don't see a tank being particularly useful in any sort of raw scenario should hit the fan scenario home defense scenario hunting it's not the sort of weaponry i would personally own or or see a use for would i go spend and buy a bunch of class three weapons would i have a bunch of ghost guns and suppressed weapons and everything like that if i'm sitting on a few million you bet you 100 percent chance no doubt about it would i own a tank probably not i just don't see the practical benefit of it in any scenario that I could envision worst case scenario in the future. If anything, a tank would just make you a big target in uh, any sort of serious situation down the road, whether we have a revolution, an economic collapse, a full shit hit the fan scenario, some environmental disaster that causes these things to happen. A tank wouldn't be something I would find particularly useful in that. So my answer is no. While it has a cool factor, to me it would be just a waste of money even if I had millions to throw away. I find more practical and fun applications for those. All right, next question and last question of the week. If your future tactical business expanded to a point where you were operating internationally, would you deal with clients from countries whose culture you disagree with morally, such as the Middle East, or would you take the business as business viewpoint? No, I wouldn't deal with cultures that I find that I have a problem with or I consider dangerous at all. So no, I, if I was dealing with this stuff internationally, I absolutely would not deal uh, with any Islamic countries. And I'll take a, a page from my father on this. My father, as I have mentioned earlier, self-made millionaire, ex-special ex forces from Vietnam. Uh, he has worked in upper management in some major corporations like Cameron International. And this came up in a business meeting with him one day. My father is, um, there's no surprise that he doesn't like Islam and he doesn't like Islamic countries. Shouldn't come as a shock to anybody. This came up in a big business meeting. There was a, an Islamic country, and I'm not gonna name which one, that had offered them on a contract for some natural gas related projects, offered them like a 3% better price on some work or a contract than someone else had. And people were like, well, you know, we can make a lot of money on this. And my father discussed in the business meeting and discussed responsibility in business and responsibility of dealing with your potential enemies in war and the risk of funding terrorists that might come back to haunt them personally and their own families and their own cities because they could be funding terrorism 
are helping terrorists who would later maybe attack our homeland one day and maybe even attack our city and that because of that we have an ethical responsibility to go do business with other people. And everyone took his proposal seriously and they did not accept that contract. So uh, I might not always like my father's ethics, I may not agree with him, but I happen to agree with that sort of mindset there. No, I, it, I would find that for my business, I know business is business and normally I see it that way. There are times when I'm willing to do certain things for business or money other people might not be willing to do. But when it comes to endorsing countries, cultures, potential terrorists, people that I might have to see as an enemy in the future in any sort of real conflict, obviously I would not want to do business with them. And anyone that I feel is a high risk person for that, even if I'm running a tactical school later, if I'm selling, a, running a class three weapon shop, if I'm doing that sort of stuff in the future, people who I personally just don't like their vibe, I think they're involved in a group that I consider a potential violent enemy that I might have to deal with one day, there is no way I would work with them. There's no way I, I would sell them equipment. There's no way I would train them. That's just my personal business ethics. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.